It all started so innocently. All I wanted was a few aluminium rings. Biggish rings, not huge rings. So I bought a nice big tube, thinking I'd just slice it up. Then realised it wouldn't fit in my bandsaw. <coughs> Things escalated and I was swept up in a whirlwind of late night CAD. Those rarely end well. However, this time the result was Spider Mandrel. Born in a fiery supernova maybe 10 billion years ago, some atoms of iron gradually coalesced and ended up in a solar disk, which collapsed under gravity and became our sun and planets. Geology happened, then biology, and then civilization, and then online shopping, which is how the parts of Spider Mandrel eventually turned up in my machine shop. In the last episode, I made the main shaft collars and legs. This time, I'm machining the jaws and lock nuts and looking in more detail how the jaws are attached. I have to make a fixture so I can machine the spanner flats and then... There's a surprising plot twist. Stay tuned and all will be revealed. The jaws are made from 30mm brass round bar with an M12 clearance hole, which, according to page 1660 of the machinery's handbook, is a convenient but sloppy 13mm diameter. In a wildly anti-establishment move, I'm making it 12.3mm. So radical, Ned Ludd would be very proud. The outside diameters turn to 29.62mm because it's a nice sounding number with no occult significance and isn't seen as unlucky by any of the civilizations on the planet according to Wikipedia. The outer face will be the finished surface which is in contact with the lock nuts so I'm giving it a generous countersink and outside chamfer. I'll be doing further machining operations on the other face to make the jaw teeth so I don't need to do any special cleanup of the parted surface. I'm measuring the position of the parting tool using the DRO. Off camera I did the usual with a straight edge across the part, adjusting the parting tool Y position so it just catches the edge of the ruler and clicks, and then zeroing the DRO and moving in the required distance. I used a 45 degree angle block to set an ER40 collet block in the mill vise at, well, 45 degrees. It's kind of implied by the name 45 degree angle block, I guess. This stage is very much artisan hand crafting, making cuts with a roughing mill until the jaws present a semi-menacing bite but retain a trust-inspiring grip. Definitely more art than science. Once it looks about right, it's then a case of cutting the two chamfers and two 45 degree grooves to about the same size on each of the... Oh, nearly dropped a plot spoiler there. On each of the six jaws. Yes, definitely only six. Super, that's the last one. 
And before Amy leaps in with her non-existent work boots, that bore finish is horrible because Mr. Cleverclogs here decided not to use the razor-sharp 13mm cobalt split-point stub drill that the book says, and used a janky old drill he found in an old toolbox. Blunt doesn't even begin to describe its lack of edge. It'll polish out, as a great machinist once said. Popping the jaws into a collet chuck on the lathe, I'm using a rather inappropriate six-flute ruffer as a flat-bottomed drill to cut the counterbore for the retaining washer in each jaw. I need to leave a 5mm lip at the bottom of the hole, so this gives me a perfect opportunity to use one of my groove micrometers to measure the size of the remaining lip. I'll take a measurement after cutting part way through, then zero the tailstock DRO with the tool bottomed out in the hole it just cut, so I can take the rest of the cut in a single pass. A proper machinist would zero the DRO at the end of the first cut. Time to unleash the Mitotoyo Groove Mic. This one's got a very small set of discs which fit through really fine bores. It's not needed in this case as the hole's huge. But the only large disc groove mic I've got in 0 to 25 millimeters is Imperial, if that makes any sort of sense. Remembering which scale to read always takes me an extra couple of seconds of cogitation and bewilderment. Rather like reading the slanted markings on my tether outside micrometers, I sometimes end up disambiguating the reading by measuring with a flipping digital caliper. There's no hope for me. I did think about making a collet block end stop, but with the ER40 collet there's significant movement of the y-axis position as you tighten the nut. That makes it hard to set a stop, as the part would jam against the stop as it tightened and cause all sorts of problems. With a 5C collet block, things are better because the end position of the collet's fixed and threaded and the part doesn't move so much as compared with it does in an ER collet. That's going to mean spending even more pocket money. Gosh, that looks remarkably like the CAD drawing. Only set, oops, uh, five more to go, five. <clears throat> The groove mic says I missed the mark by 20 micrometers because of over-enthusiastic tailstock winding, but half a millimetre either way would still be intolerant, so it'll have to do. I love this tool. I had to save my pocket money for ages to afford it. The brass jaws are free to rotate about their bore axis to take up any surface imperfections inside the tube that's been machined. I need to have a way to prevent unwanted rotation while tightening up the lock nuts that apply pressure under the jaws. The simplest approach seems to be milling flats into the sides of the jaws, then I should be able to use an open wrench to hold the jaw in the right orientation. At this point the realisation hit me. There was no way now to hold the jaw far enough out of the vise to mill the flats as I'd carefully cut away a lot of the face of the jaws. Luckily, I've got a very well-stocked bin with all of my failed machining projects and bar ends in it. Stuff that's too small to be much use for anything at all. I found a short bit of 16mm steel bar that was about an inch long and set about hacking it into shape, cleaning up one face and turning a 12mm diameter spigot on the other end that's long enough so the spigot presses against the 5mm lip without fouling the jaggedy jaw teeth, allowing me to apply plenty of gronk to the vice to hold the jaw in place while the mill does its dirty work.
I shouldn't really be surprised when things fit, but wow. Did anyone else notice that Neil forgot to chamfer the nasty sharp edges of that spigot? I bet he'll cut his finger again. My quantum vision cortex has detected that the spigots are tad too stubby. I've messaged him on WhatsApp. Oh good grief, who's that? Ow, that's sharp. I was going to make the flats an inch across, and I got some nice old spanners that I found in my father's toolbox. But I found a thin, flat, 24mm wrench of uncertain parentage, and picked that on grounds of elegance, beauty, but mostly it's lack of rust. The spigot fixture seems to grip well. I'll align the jaws horizontally by eye and touch off this end mill on the top edge, locking the spindle and zero in the Z-axis DRO. The jaws are 29.62mm diameter, and I want the dimension across the flats to be 24mm. The axis of the jaws at 14.81mm below the top edge. The cut needs to be 12mm above that, so if my sums are right for once, I need to remove 2.81 millimetres from the jaw for the first flat. What can possibly go wrong? Amy, that's what we call a rhetorical question, so please disable your algorithmic opinion engine. Now the first flats are milled, I can use a thin parallel and zero the z-axis with the tool resting on the top edge of that parallel. Then drop the table by 24mm and machine the second flat. I'll be deburring off camera so I don't slice my fingertips again on the wicked burr that that tool raised. Look at that horrible burr. That long series mill was a dreadful choice for this operation. You can't fool me, that's a three-quarter job and you were too lazy to swap to that lovely sharp 16mm carbide slot drill because you'd have to change collets. Good grief, man. Get a grit. Next parts to make are the retaining washers to keep the jaws from falling off the ends of the threaded studs. They need to be 2mm thick and a little under 16mm diameter with a countersunk M4 clearance hole for the retaining screw. I made them from a long piece of 16mm brass bar. I didn't want to saw a piece off as my scrap bin's already overflowing with bar ends. So I used a headstock spider I made a while ago to support the bar through the lathe headstock to help reduce any risk of the free 80 sems or so of the bar bending and whipping round at 1000 rpm, which is roughly Mach 0.25, 187 miles an hour or 300 kilometers per hour, enough to cause major inconvenience to the ambulance service and the accident emergency department of the local hospital. I must make a video about making the set of headstock spiders and the conversion from three to four brass tip screws. Not that that has any relevance at all to this video, oh no. Adjusting the bar for concentricity is a bit more complex with three independent screws. Unlike with a four jaw chuck, the side to side and up down directions interact. But if you remember that moving one jaw by a certain fraction of a turn then needs compensating by turning the other two exactly half as much, it soon gets to be second nature. The three screw version was originally intended for holding hex bar and to lock custom Delrin bungs in place for material smaller than half an inch diameter. Yeah, I must make a bit about that. Make a note of that please, Amy. Make it yourself. I'm strictly text to speech. Hey Alexa, he wants you to make a note. 
Okay, what should the note say? Something something spider bung something. Okay, I've saved your note. I'll spin through this at breakneck speed because I covered the detail of these operations in a previous video, but for mysterious and undisclosed reasons, I needed some more of these countersunk washers. That's in addition to the one I dropped on the floor that rolled underneath the lathe and is refusing to come out because it says it's scared of the blowtorch. This bar is a bit on the small side to use as a glue chuck, but I'm going to go for it anyway. There's a 4.2mm hole drilled in the face to match the parted off washers, a quick off camera chamfer of the central hole and a slight break of the edge, then a good wipe with acetone and the glue chuck's ready to roll. Well, spin. In mortal fear of activism by the Glove Prevention League, I very stupidly didn't wear gloves to protect the chuck and washer surfaces from oil and chips, but I think I got away with it. This is high viscosity cyanoacrylate that doesn't drip or run. It sets fairly rapidly. Marvellous stuff. I have deleted the embarrassing incident where the ever-present CA glue antidote, sorry I mean solvent, was just out of reach after I glued my finger extremely securely to one of the washers and the chuck following over-enthusiastic application of this sticky jollop. I zeroed the DRO each time I faced off the glue chuck and tried to apply similar pressure when gluing the washers in place so I could set the DRO at 2mm and be confident that the washers would be in tolerance. I cut a decent chamfer and countersink and then applied a fiery blast of propane to soften the glue to release the finished part, ready for facing off and gluing the next washer. That's the washers all done, the next step is to cut the M12 nuts down to 8mm thick to give a bit more adjustment for the jaws. They're just common zinc plated mild steel nuts. I'm using one of the studs I made earlier to hold the nuts for machining. I set the DRO after a couple of test cuts on the first nut, so I could cut one face down to 9mm thick, then take another millimetre off the other face. I used a file to chamfer the sharp edges of the nut as I didn't want to keep swapping tools.
Wow, nice high precision spacer. I like it. That vicious stringy chip in the bore looks like it's an accident waiting to happen. So I'm wearing my cut proof gloves and using a scraper and file to clean up the nuts without any significant injuries. Right, that's all the studs, washers and nuts finished, so now it's time to drill and tap the sliding collars to take those studs. I'm using a sacrificial mandrel to hold the collar for the drilling and tapping. It's got a mill groove for the grub screws to tighten into and a 30mm spigot which fits into an ER40 hex collet block so I can make the three M12 tapped holes at 120 degree intervals. I'll use a clamp as an end stop for the collet block as this is a new vice and I haven't made a proper set of stops for it yet. Perhaps another note there, Amy. Sorry, Alexa. Oh, they're both ignoring me now. Rather than just countersinking the hole to get rid of the burr, I need to machine a spot face for the studs to bear against. They've got a 16mm shoulder turn on the face of the hex, so I need to cut a flat a little larger than that, coaxially with the threaded hole. It would have looked way neater to machine a full width flat. 2020 hindsight there, Mr Smith. And that's where the story of this build should have ended. But after I posted part one of this series, Chris Mai commented that he would probably have made the thing with four jaws. So I had one of those 3am ideas. There's just about enough room on the collars to drill some extra holes to make it possible to have three or four lengths on each of the collars. I'd have to make two extra studs, jaws and washers. But hey, machining stuff is fun, right? Also, I failed royally to film the process of drilling, tapping and spot facing the collars with the first three holes, so I might as well do the job properly. Huge thanks to Chris for the suggestion. In case anyone isn't aware of Chris's work, you need to go and check out his fantastic machining channel. He makes absolutely huge parts and is a true inspiration. The link's in the description. I'm aligning the slot in the sacrificial mandrel so it's roughly in the right place. Then I'll flip the part and align it precisely.
Using this conical point edge finder isn't the best solution, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. I found the centre of the collar and then adjusted the table to align the hole and used a bit of tappy tap tap to get the hole aligned with the centre of the part. There's a pretty wide tolerance on this, so I'm not going to expend any unnecessary effort. As there are four new holes at 90 degree intervals in each collar, I'm using a square collet block instead of the hex one I used to make the 120 degree holes. The first hole is well clear of the existing holes at 60 degrees away, but the other two are only 30 degrees off, and the holes and threads will intersect the existing ones. Ominous foreshadowing. I'm a huge fan of CT90 cutting compound, even though it does look a bit like earwax. I'm starting this spiral point M12 tap under power, then going in a bit further by hand. I'll finish the thread all the way through after removing the collar from the mandrel. I thought I was in with a fair chance of getting away with it, but there was one rather expensive casualty. The missing part of that high-speed steel drill attempted to leave the gravity well of this planet at an appreciable fraction of the speed of light. Its trajectory took it over my left shoulder before colliding with the ceiling. Eye protection's important, folks. That could have spoiled my day rather spectacularly if it had been 8 degrees further to the right. Chris's suggestion worked out brilliantly. It only takes a couple of minutes to swap from three to four jaw operation and back. I've got a part to machine that's made from a six inch square steel welded hollow section and I can just pop it on this mandrel with one jaw pressing against each corner and spin it in the lathe to clean up the ends. So much easier than trying to do it on the mill. I'll probably need to make several different types of soft jaws, for instance to machine thin walled tube for making 1.3 and 2.3 GHz feed horns, and for dielectric plastic radomes. I'll just turn a ring of aluminium or delrin to an exact fit inside the stock, and saw it into three or four sections, each with a hole like those in the brass jaws. Lots of fun ahead. As I'm terribly British about asking for favours, I'm somewhat reticent when it comes to making calls to action. However, it would make me deliriously happy if you felt able to poke the like button. It helps the algorithm to find other victims, uh, sorry, um, interested and engaged viewers, it says here, for this spectacularly niche content. 
I have great fun making the vids and likes encourage me to carry on inflicting Amy and my terrible machining and production skills on an unsuspecting world. Subscribing and clicking the notification bonger as well means you'll get to know when a new vid comes out even if the algorithm doesn't want you to see it. Gosh, how rebellious. Right, I think it's time to cut some rings. I've just spent minutes of my life adjusting those jaw lock nuts to try to get this wobbly tube roughly on axis, but my ridiculously fashionable camera died while I was at my labours. So that element of this demonstration is rather unfortunately consigned to the bit bucket of history. At some point in the future I'll be using spider mandrel again. I'll be sure to include plenty of spanner action. I mentioned earlier about using this simple trick to set the parting tool to be exactly flush with the outside of the workpiece, adjusting the carriage until there's almost an imperceptible click as the ruler passes the tool. You feel it more than you hear it. Hit zero on the DRO for the Y axis position and move in by how thick you want the part to be, and jobs are good. So easy. Even the meat sack could do that. 
I bet Steve Austin didn't need to use a ruler. Six million dollars seems relatively cheap now, doesn't it? These parting inserts are TIALN coated and intended for steel. Not really ideal for 6082 aluminium extrusion. I'm running at 70 RPM which is about 130 surface feet per minute in real money. That's probably a bit on the low side. I could go three or four times that fast with a proper insert with a high rake and chip corrugating geometry. But a suggestion of humming vibration starts above 100 RPM so I'm sticking with 70 as a compromise. Thanks once again to Chris Mai for the extra leg inspiration. I'm now knee deep in part finished parted off rings and weird clock spring like chips. It's been an interesting journey from that first caffeine fueled daft idea to this really useful addition to my tooling armory. This could be department of the bleed and obvious but you could simply have bought a bigger bandsaw. She's got to go.